Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Whoever you are, whatever your age, your skin color, whomever you love, wherever you are, whenever you are, as you watch this, know that you are welcome here and that we are so glad you are with us. It is good to be together. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom. And in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about throwing open the doors of this congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And as spring comes this year, vaccines are distributed, and we start to think about what comes next for this church, we're considering some big questions. What are our commitments? What are we becoming? What is our story? These are questions that define us and will continue to do so in the future. And churches are generational projects. But right now we don't have to look far into the future to ask what our next steps are. In these closing months of the pandemic, as we look to the future and plan our return to this building, we gather together in hope. There is work to be done, beloveds. Let's be about it. Our chalice lighting words this week, and indeed each of the readings today, are from the Reverend Lynn Ungar. Reverend Ungar has chronicled the last year in verse, speaking from an authentically Unitarian Universalist voice, and often transcending our denomination. We begin with the poem Pandemic, which she wrote on March 11th, 2020. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, Give up just for now on trying to make this world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in another's hands, surely. That has come clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your heart, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. We would be one in building 
Our story today is called, Has Anyone Seen Normal? The Coronavirus Tale by Lacey and Ace Stryker. Has anyone seen normal? He's been missing for days. He was there last Thursday at my piano lesson, but when it was time to bake on Saturday, normal was gone. It just isn't like him to not show up. I really miss him. Do you know when Normal's coming back? The last time I saw him was six days ago, or a year ago. I remember because it was the same day that guy came to town. That guy over there, his name is Chaos, and nothing has been the same since he showed up. When he came to town, people started to get sick. The first thing he did was close down dance class, piano lessons, and vacations. Then chaos kicked everyone out of school, the students, the teachers, even the principal, but he didn't stop there. Chaos said, I couldn't play with Jen for a while. No Tony or Chrissy, no kids on my block. I stare out the window and wonder where has normal gone? Chaos closed down the zoo, the library, and the playgrounds and churches. Not much is the same. Many good things are gone. Things like friends and parties and even toilet paper. I wonder if chaos scared normal away with those masks everyone's wearing these days. Mom and dad keep saying, it won't always be like this. But what if chaos is here to stay? Will he scare everyone away? Hasn't anyone seen normal? Maybe I can try to do things I liked before, but in a different way. Would it feel like normal was still here? Chaos told everyone to stay away, but maybe I can leave some cookies on the doorstep of Patty and Dave. Normal and I like to draw silly things. So maybe I can draw pictures for the cars driving past. You might also see in your weekly email or parent email some chalice Easter egg pictures that you can hang on your window. And since my piano recital is canceled, maybe I can open my windows and play for my neighbors as they walk by. Is it true what they say that a smile goes a long way? because there is a lot of distance between us these days. Still, things are starting to feel almost normal. Normal, is that you? You look so different, what happened to you? Chaos is still here, he hasn't gone away. But guess what, I'm happy anyway. I learned that I can be happy even when things aren't the same. You have changed, normal but I've changed too. And that is the end of our story today. Thanks so much. Each week as part of our commitment to each other and this congregation, we take up a collection to support the work of this church and our partners in the community. As this next song plays, you're invited to text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln, and the amount you wish to give to 73256. And as a reminder, this invitation is available through the week as well. So if you're watching this on a Tuesday night or have just discovered the Unitarian Church and are going through our back catalog a few months from now, the invitation is still there to text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your support and your generosity. Stop. 
These are the words of Douglas Malick. His poem is called Good Timber. The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, but stood out in the open plain and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil to gain and farm his patch of soil, who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air, never became a manly man, but lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow with ease. The stronger wind, the stronger trees. The further sky, the greater length. The more the storm, the more the strength. By sun and cold, by rain and snow, in trees and men good timbers grow. Where thickest lies the forest growth, we find the patriarchs of both. And they hold counsel with the stars, whose broken branches show the scars of many winds and much of strife. This is the common law of life. Malik's poem tells us that those of us who live alone, who don't have a shared sense of community, may not be as strong as we need to be. Luckily for us in this community, we have each other to share both our joys and our sorrows. If you feel so inclined, please type your name or the name of someone that you're holding in your heart in the chat box.
Counting. How easy it is to get pulled under by the riptide of numbers, the grip of statistics dragging us out in their litany of loss. Some numbers are too large to reckon, knowing that each number is a life. We don't yet know how to mourn the particulars of these sums. For now, count smaller things. Raindrops on the roof, thousands comfort in a time of drought. Trees visible from my windows, six, one decked in the fluffy pompons of spring. Eggs in the refrigerator, eight, enough for breakfast and possibly cake. Birds in the bush, two, nettily attired in black and russet and spots. Dogs at my feet, also two, both happy that we're together. I don't know if there is some grand accounting at the end, a god who will weigh your soul against a feather. It seems unlikely. But one way or another, it's probably worth considering what counts. A year ago today, I went to a wedding. It was unusually a wedding of some friends who are not a part of this church, and I had, even more unusually for me, no responsibilities at this wedding whatsoever. Stacy and I had been looking forward to the event for a while. When I had first RSVP'd months earlier, it was just me. But then the work trip that Stacy was supposed to be on got canceled, and we asked the couple if I could go back and retroactively add somebody to the guest list. We got a babysitter, got dressed up, and spent the evening celebrating at the Scottish Rite Temple downtown. There was a cash bar with a really excellent scotch selection. In this, the Scottish Rite is well named. Good friends and a a baby that we met for the first time. Stacy even got me onto the dance floor for a bit. It was just a wedding. A bunch of people gathering to celebrate the work of love in the world and the work of love in the lives of these two people. Of course, that isn't the only way to tell that story. The reason Stacy was there, and not on her work trip, is that Mount Sinai Hospital had canceled work travel as they started getting cases of a new novel coronavirus in New York City. There was room for a last minute addition to the guest list, because several out-of-town friends decided not to travel. And two days before the wedding, on on Thursday night, I had met with UCL's safety team here at the church, on Zoom, actually, to decide that we were closing the church's building, effective on March 16th, Monday. By the time we were at the wedding on Saturday night, both Stacy and I and most of the people there knew that this was probably the last time for a while that we would gather in such a way. Joy and sorrow are woven fine William Blake rope, and they were tangible that night. Of course, what I did not know, perhaps we could not know, could not conceive, is that a year after that night, many of us that were there have not seen each other in person since. I have not danced or sung in a group. The prospect of sitting down at a bar and ordering from a well-selected, well-stocked scotch selection fills me with longing and anxiety in equal measure. Babysitters are a glorious dream. Today we mark our 52nd consecutive Sunday morning together online. It is a remarkable moment, awful both in the sense of loss and awe at the resilience of this community. But it is a loss, make no mistake. The changes forced by the COVID-19 pandemic have have covered almost every part of life and have touched us all, 
Some of those changes are universal and some are deeply, deeply personal. What is not helpful is to compare or to say, well, others have it harder, so what do I have to complain about it? Here's the way the author Julie Beck put that in The Atlantic this week. There are so many things to mourn, obvious and invisible, devastating and subtle, that we may have difficulty talking about and honoring what we're experiencing, especially while it's still happening. Still. Still, the word of the year, perhaps, in both its meanings, a lack of motion and an exhausting ongoingness. I find myself wanting to apologize whenever I show sadness. I'm incredibly lucky, and I know it. I'm not sick. I have a job. I live with a person I love whom I can touch. No one I know has died from the virus. I've lost nothing this year but the life that I used to know, which everyone else has lost too. But it's too much, isn't it, to carry this weight and politely pretend that it doesn't make us stumble because others are carrying more? What that does is set up a competition of whose loss is better and whose loss is worthy. Divine said, as if there is a finite amount of sadness in the world and you shouldn't take up more than your share. She thinks that we can respect all the different losses people are experiencing without suggesting that they're equal. When we normalize and respect our own losses, that gives us the energy to respect other losses. When we're stingy, that's when we get into compassion warfare. Those who've lost more resent those who've lost less, while those who've lost less may think they don't have permission to mourn. One year of pandemic. Of the many things that I mourn from the last year is that it is a full year. That from a combination of virulence, missed opportunities, and human imperfection, we are here at the end of 12 months, and not yet at the end. I know we are approaching an end, slower than I would like, but there nonetheless, but it has been a long time. In the meantime, waiting for an end, I'm stuck with accounting. What can we say about a year of pandemic that hasn't already been said? Colleagues of mine were comparing notes about this service, struggling with how to conceptualize it. We are going to use Seasons of Love, the song from Rent, said one. 525,600 minutes, how do you measure a year? What a, what a lovely idea, came the response from another. But have you considered that this week, within days of this anniversary, the number of people dead in this country from the pandemic will hit 525,600? One death a minute. One of the ways to measure a year. Friends, beloveds, if you look at the text of sermons I've preached here for the last four years, I did. All 215 manuscripts from Sunday mornings to Thursday nights. You can find exactly one instance where I used the word trauma in a sermon. This is intentional and for two reasons. First, I think overuse can have the unintended consequence of devaluing or delegitimizing any experience. And trauma is a rupture, an open wound, and I do not want to wade in sermons into which events are traumatic and which are not, what Beck calls compassion warfare. And, Maybe more importantly, trauma is an intensely personal experience. Each person moves through it and recovers in unique ways. And sermons, this format, especially online, is by nature about collective experience. But to everything, there is a season. 
One of the resources we have access to as a congregation is the UU Trauma Response Ministry. This ministry of Unitarian Universalism consists of teams of volunteers, ministers, other lay folks who deploy to communities recovering from mass trauma, say the unexpected death of a staff member in a church or a major natural disaster. They are trained in trauma response and so speak about it both clinically and compassionately. Often their role is to help a congregation name what it mourns or fears. And as you can guess, they have had a busy year. And even these experts in mass traumatic events have been working without a script for much of the last year. The literature on large scale critical events was all written when the largest scale event events were named Sandy and Katrina. Still, they put a message together for congregations on this anniversary. And so we're going to take some time in our service to watch it together this morning. March 14th is the anniversary of the Unitarian Universalist Association's recommendation that congregations stop meeting in person due to the pandemic. Your congregation, like others across the country, experienced a dramatic shift, cr a critical incident when the COVID-19 shutdown took effect. It affected everything about how we worship, learn, socialize and show compassion for each other. On a personal level, the pandemic, the shutdowns and response or lack of response have likely affected how you live, work, interact with your family and friends, how you celebrate milestones and even how you shop and access healthcare. You may have experienced a range of reactions and feelings including grief related to the changes and losses you and your congregation have experienced. We are with the Unitarian Universalist Trauma Response Ministry, a national organization of clergy and vo lay volunteers. We help ministers, boards, religious educators, and congregations when things become challenging or overwhelming. And we are here today to help you begin to put this past year into perspective. Unlike many critical incidents, such as an unexpected death or property damage, this pandemic has been unsettling, disruptive and ongoing. For some people, especially those with marginalized identities, it may also have been traumatic. Our hope is that you can appreciate the resilience and coping skills you have developed over your lifetime. It may also be helpful to know that critical events and their aftermath have a predictable trajectory. You may recall the first pre-disaster pre phase when news came out about a mystery virus. It seemed like a faraway problem. There was no need to worry about until one day it became clear that COVID-19 was really dangerous. You may have felt worried and confused about the next steps. Mid-March last year, the UUA advised congregations to end in-person worship and programming, and the impact of the pandemic became real. A critical incident occurred that required you your family and the congregation to focus on survival. You or others may have experienced stress responses such as irritability, sweating, confusion, trouble sleeping, and time distortion. Then came a heroic phase when people sewed masks, delivered hand sanitizers and groceries, created social pods, started in-home schooling and Zoom worship, and rang bells to celebrate healthcare workers. It was a high energy period, but our bodies cannot sustain that level of effort. The third phase was predictable. 
disillusionment, taking inventory of losses as this virus affected, sometimes killed people you know and loved. There, have been, there has been isolation and suffering from financial losses and many people have fought for resources. It wouldn't be surprising if people found Zoom worship and programming lacking and may have lashed out at the minister, director of religious, religious education, board or musicians for not performing up to your expectations. Compounding all of that was a period of political and social unrest as the entire country seemed to become polarized. Arguments about dismantling white supremacy, culture within our own religious movement made even this faith feel like anything but a safe haven for many people. Many congregations and communities remain in the disillusionment phase. Frankly, it hurts. We all want things to be different. It's important to remember that many of us are experiencing compassion fatigue and burnout. We urge you to hold on, have faith. A time will come when the pandemic will turn a corner. It will likely take many more months but eventually it will be time to focus on new beginning, a time of reconstruction when we build on what we've gained through this experience. In the meantime, this anniversary may trigger emotional and physical responses. It's not unusual for feelings of grief and loss to bring up grief and loss from the past. You may feel clumsy or your thoughts may be muddled, you may experience sleep disturbances, changes in appetite or bouts of sadness, depression, annoyance, and anger. You may judge yourself harshly, thinking you're overreacting, but these are symptoms of critical incident stress are to be expected in this abnormal situation. These pressures cause stress hormones to course through our, your system. They are designed to gear up your bodies for fight flee or freeze in an emergency. But this pandemic has lasted a year and no quick end is in sight. So these hormones are overflowing. Sometimes simply naming stresses brings some relief. Let's pause for a moment while you reflect on the kinds of pressure and stressors affecting your life now. We encourage you to identify what's helped before when you were under enormous stress and pressure. The activities and rituals you found helpful before may also be helpful now. Maybe it's time alone in a hot bath or shower or cuddling within your social pod or exercising, watching videos or crafting. You may take comfort and strength from being in virtual community with those who share your racial, cultural, or sexual identity. Paths to self-healing are as individual as we are. The coming of spring is a good time to reawaken a sense of compassion, to forgive each other and to forgive ourselves. We can, as Reverend Robert Eller Isaac says, begin again in love. The UU Trauma Response Ministry is available to support your congregation if your minister or board deems it helpful. We have faith that individually and collectively, you will make it through this pandemic. We encourage you to share that faith. Thank you. The last hard lesson about trauma for this sermon today is this. That chart that the Trauma Response Ministry uses was developed by the U.S. government after observing the aftermath of major disasters in communities. The timeline for recovery that it lays out is one to three years. And that, remember, is based on a world where Sandy and Katrina were the big disasters. 
We actually don't know how long recovery takes after a global pandemic or what it looks like. We've never done this before in living memory. But here's what gives me hope, despite what has been a somewhat melancholy message this morning. Despite and in the midst of this pandemic, the congregation is still here. Some 150 of you watch the service most weeks, and we haven't changed what we're preaching. In the midst of a global pandemic, we gather once a week to proclaim interconnection, to say that a better world is possible, to say that it is necessary to bring that better world about. What does it mean to have faith in such times? We have all lost things precious to us in the last year, even if it was only the life we used to know, full of babysitters and weddings at the Scottish Rite. We have all had cause to doubt that a better world is possible. Faith is a house of many rooms, the title character of Life of Pi proclaims. But no room for doubt, he's asked. Oh, plenty on every floor. Doubt is useful. It keeps faith a living thing. After all, you cannot know the strength of your faith until it is tested. Here we are. At the end of this remarkable, awful first year of pandemic, here in this place of remarkable faith, in this community of awesome hope, close as we begin with words from the Reverend Lynn Ungar, who writes, how do you live and what are your fears during this crisis? What a question to surface after midnight from across the world. In your country, is it the time of day to wrestle all the existential and daily dreads until like Jacob and the vicious angel, they concede to bless us? I am afraid that the people I love will die. I am afraid that my child is inheriting a world so much harsher than what she deserves. I am afraid that desperate times call for desperate measures, and I, I am not quite desperate enough. Should I go on? I am afraid that people have wandered away from the very idea of truth. I am afraid we have unlearned how to speak and how to listen. I am afraid that the fabric that holds us together is woven more loosely than I thought. And people keep slipping through. And how do you live? With grief, with fear, with laughter, with boredom, with glee, with contentment, with fury, with hope, with the firm conviction that no thing cancels any other thing out. Death does not cancel life. Grief does not cancel joy. Fear does not cancel conviction, nor any of those statements in reverse. Make your heart a bowl that is large enough to hold it all. Imagine that you are the potter. Stretch the clay. Cherish the turning wheel. Accept that the bowl is never going to be done. Amen. And be at peace, beloveds.